Good evening, and welcome to this Leon Levy biography event carried live on Crowdcast. My name is Kai Bird. I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, which is housed at CUNY. Uh, over the past 13 years, the Levy Center has awarded 54 major fellowships to work in biography. Five of $70,000 fellowships are awarded each year, generously funded all these years by, by Shelby White and the Lee Foundation. To date, some 23 biographies have been published, including this one by our guest this evening. Blake Gopnik has been the chief art critic for the Washington Post and the art and design critic for Newsweek and critic at large for Art News. He is now a regular contributor to the New York Times. While working on his biography of Andy Warhol, he was both a resident fellow at the Leon Levy Center at CUNY and a recipient of a Coleman Fellowship at the New York Public Library. Annalyn Swan will be interviewing Gopnik, and she has co-authored two biographies of artists with her husband, the art critic, Mark Stevens. The first, De Kooning, an American master, won the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for biography and the National Book Critics Circle Award and was named one of the 10, 10 best books of 2005 by the New York Times. I'm sorry, I'm hearing a terrible echo. Uh, her second biography, Francis Bacon, will be published in the US by Knopf in November 2020. And before handing off to Annalyn, I just want to say, I, I hope this is, provides intellectual entertainment in the midst of this terrible pandemic. The pandemic rages on. But one good thing out of it is that biographers just sit and in isolation and are being very productive. So Anna Lynn has just finished her new biography. And I have actually just turned in my own manuscript on Jimmy Carter. So one, one small good thing out of this terrible pandemic. Anyway, I'm going to hand off to Annalyn, and I want to also say that our next live video event will be on August 6th, Hiroshima Day, with Nancy Greenspan, uh, who will have a conversation with me about her biography of how she the atomic spy. Please check our Leon Levy website for postings about other future events in August and September. So I turn it over to Emily. Thank you, Kai. Uh, and you made exactly the same point I was going to make, which is woohoo, biographers can continue on in the face of COVID. But, you know, Blake, we're here to celebrate this evening this Warhol, very large, uh, very impressive. Um, and as a biographer of more, shall we say, representational artists, uh, de Kooning was abstract more than figurative, but of course, Francis Bacon is famously figurative. I would like to begin by asking you, why Warhol? He's not exactly an easy subject. I was thinking about this, and he's a kind of shapeshifter who, as you rightly noted in your book, every other year he was coming up with a new venture, a new image, a new factory, a, a new everything. So. You knew it was a very, uh, very complex subject. And tell us why then you embarked on him. Uh, if only I had realized what a complex subject he was. <laughs> I have to admit that I didn't quite know what I was getting into when I started this whole thing. I mean, it seemed very obvious uh, that a Warhol biography was needed. He's a canonical artist, more than just about any artist you could think of. And we finally have distance on him. He's been dead long enough that we have some perspective. But the amazing thing is that he's still relevant. He's wildly relevant. He feels like an artist from today. 
And that combination is what made me think that he'd be the perfect subject for a biography. There, I don't think there are that many figures like that. I mean, James Baldwin seems like such a figure who's from the 60s, but still matters to us today in a very special way. So that's what got me started uh, with Laurel Hall. Um, that and the fact that if he and his art are still in contention, there's still question about what he means, what his art means, what we think about him. He's not a kind of stable figure from the past. So it sounded to me as though it would be exciting to write about him. And it was the fact that, I mean, obviously he's an artist, but there seemed to be a special connection between his art and his life. So though I had never written a biography before, it seemed to me as though I'd be able to wear the three hats that I, that I, that I possess. That is my hat as an art critic, my hat as an art historian, and my hat as a, as a popular journalist. And it seemed to me that this would be a way to, to do all those three things, it's our history, our criticism, and uh, the narrative stuff. You seemed to me that all be necessary to tell the story. And then the fact that there was this amazing archive to bring to bear. I mean, I knew about the archive in, uh, in Pittsburgh and the fact that it had recently been more or less inventoried or even thought it had been in a way it never had been before. So all the earlier biographies, Hadn't stop right enough. there for one second, Blake, because I, I I need to put this in perspective for our listeners because not only did you have an archive which we want to hear more about, but most of us, in fact, virtually everyone, has the problem of digging, you know, digging, endless digging, looking for more clues into our artists. Whereas you had exactly the opposite problem thousands, right? A hundred thousand various items, right? So tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, that, I thought that this would be the great thing about being a, a Warhol biographer is that I'd have access to this archive, which had only recently been inventoried. I thought this is going to be easy. But of course, as you say, it's the opposite. Warhol is, was such a hoarder of documents, among other things. I mean, he kept every ticket stub, every invoice. Um, it seemed to me that this would be incredibly enlightening. But at the same time, it, it was the opposite. I mean, a lot of people who have now read the book, some people feel I left nothing out and could have left a lot more out. But of course, other people feel that I've missed all the important things. And those people are usually people who had some stake in Warhol. All the people who were Warholian feel I didn't write about them enough. So I guess it's okay if they feel that way. Um, but the problem, as you say, was figuring out what to, what to include. And the truth is I have a background, some background in academia, and I have a huge fondness for the sciences. So you could say that I was using a kind of scientific model that is, I believed in including only the facts, only the information that was relevant to my argument about Andy Warhol, that seemed directly relevant to the kind of story I wanted to tell, the kind of arguments I wanted to make. And in that sense, it was kind of scientific. That is, I had a set of hypotheses about Andy, and I tested them against all this information I had. I tried not just to present random information, because that is a disease with biography, danger with biography, is that you end up just including facts for the sake of it. And yeah. Exactly. But you know, it is interesting because you want it obviously in a project like this to set off to be the definitive biographer. There has never, I mean, Bob Colicello wrote a very, you know, appealing and engaging book, but you are in this for a different reason, which is more, as you said, academic. So it does become extremely hard. And my husband and I were talking about it as in, you know, you, you don't want someone else coming out in two or three years with some of the facts that you deliberately left out. You know, it's a struggle. So I can, you know, how much do you think was left on the cutting room floor when all is said and done? Do you have some idea? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I could have written, I mean, it's the book is about almost a thousand pages. I could have easily written four volumes like that. I could have gone, I could have gone full Richardson and just written volume and vol after volume on Warhol. And in a sense, I did because, you know, I have all these endless endnotes that are available online. And a lot of the information that I cut from the final book is in the endnotes. So that helps a lot. It's actually great to have that as an option. And I'm still adding to it because I've got this crazy page um, web page of addenda that I'm adding to every single day and still making discoveries. Um, yeah, but you're you know, 
Yeah, because most of us are stuck with it being in the book. You know, it's finito. On the other hand, like it sounds like you're going to be at this for another 10 years. But another quick question, and I know we should be going to slides, but you mentioned Picasso, the other great name. And in, in the book, you actually say that you think that Andy Warhol has displaced uh, Picasso, or at least is giving him a great run for his money as the single greatest uh, Western artist of the 20th century. So could you just tell us a little bit about that and how you came to that? Because, you know, Picasso is Picasso with all the great draftsmanship skills and everything else. So that's an interesting statement for you to make. It is a terribly interesting statement, I'm sure, except I have no idea what it is because I lost you completely there for your entire question, except the last half of phrase. So um, if you can quickly repeat it, Annalyn, that might make it easier for me to answer. Sorry about that. There's a computer. Oh, sorry there. about this. Can you hear me now, Blake? Now I can. Thanks. Okay. So what I was very quickly uh, riffing on was was uh, your previous statement. You had mentioned Picasso's name and uh, in the in the context of Richardson. And one of the things that really interested me a lot, and I thought about it a lot when I was reading your book, and you said that uh, that Warhol, uh, in your opinion, has in effect either displaced uh, Picasso as the great 20th century figure, possibly icon, uh, or at least is giving him a run for his money. So I would love to hear, you know, your thoughts on that. Well, you know, artistically, these days, you probably have more people than Warhol. So I think, in a practical way, that's simply the case. Um, but I do think we have such an expanded notion of art these days. I mean, Picasso was an absolutely brilliant artist, but he made sculptures and he made paintings and prints, right? He, in a sense, the, the framing of his practice was pretty traditional. Whereas Warhol really expanded hugely. He was a work of art, as we'll be talking maybe about in a few minutes. He did everything imaginable. He did video, he did film, he did ads. Um, that notion of a hugely expanded feel for art, I think really begins with Warhol more than anyone else. So whether he's greater or not is a sort of silly parlor game, but I think you could argue that he's more influential, that his expansion of the field, whether you like it or not, has been vastly influential on everything that happens now. I mean, I think you could argue that a lot of Warhol's art could be made today. And I don't think you could say that about Picasso anymore. You know, also you were in a position uh, with so much material and, and going, making your deep dive that you actually could tell the difference between Andy saying that he, was he a brilliant uh, fake or was he real? And given that all of this research you had at your disposal, uh, you what what how did that lead you to your final um, you know opinion of Warhol as a, a you know a powerful artist? Well, I mean, one of the things that I really discovered, and this uh, has to do partly with just looking at the the notes from his education, his college education in Pittsburgh, is how serious he was as an artist. That is, in some ways, he's traditional or a traditional modern artist, at least he wanted to be a great artist. And that, in a way, is the most important take home from my book, that he's not just this wacky figure who inhabited popular culture. He's not just a strange guy who said, you know, go, oh, gee, I don't know, that underneath that, he was quite traditional in his desire to be a great artist. Um, and he was a direct rival of Picasso. I mean, from very early on, it's pretty clear he saw Picasso as the guy he had to beat and did his very best to beat him. So in that sense, Warhol himself set up the parameters for the Picasso-Warhol uh, comparison. That is so interesting because Francis Bacon said he's the great, you know, talent of the 20th century about Picasso. So he went the other way. But enough about Bacon. Let us turn to so that you can actually walk us through, if you would, some of your slides at the various points of Warhol's career. Yeah, let's take a look at some art. That's always a better thing to do than looking at a couple of art critics. Um, let me see if I can make this happen on here. Excuse me one second. I think that I have now shared my screen, so you should be able to see an image by Andy Warhol. And this is, of course, this is what, five of his famous um, Campbell soup cans, which he showed exactly 58 years ago today, on July 9th, 1962, at the Ferris Gallery in Los Angeles. This is where his career in pop art really began. Um, this is what made him famous, this already 
by showing these 32 absurd paintings that were nothing more than paintings of Campbell's soup cans, he really they hit the kind of fame that never left him again. I just realized just before we went live today that uh, that was 58 years ago and Warhol lived to be 58. So the distance between these being shown in today is the spans the entire uh, span of Warhol's life, in fact, which is strange because you think of it as in a way as having happened not that long ago. These st still seem uh, very, very relevant. And one of the things that as a biographer interests me about these um, is that they come, of course, with a Genesis story. Everything, every work of art comes with a Genesis story. And I think a lot of people know that Genesis story. That was because he painted these because he loved soup, Campbell's soup, and ate it every single day. We've all heard that story. Except there's a rival story that says the reason he painted them is because he hated Campbell's soup and was forced to eat it every day. And that's the most important issue in a way if we're talking about artist biographies. When you're, when you're writing a biography of Andy Warhol, the problem is that he was set out from the very beginning to foil people like me. I sometimes think that his whole life was dedicated to making my life a misery, right? He lied, I shouldn't say lied, he obfuscated, let's be polite for a minute. He obfuscated, he concealed information, he gave fa false information constantly which I don't think is completely typical of all biographical subjects. I don't think any of them come clean, but he came dirty, as it were, at every possible moment. So the predicament about writing about Warhol is that the man himself is my very worst possible source on the man himself. You think you go to the horse's mouth and you find out what the truth is, but with Warhol, it's exactly the opposite. If he said something about himself, it's more likely to be a red herring than not. So that puts a biographer in a kind of weird position. And even his lies are often not even coming from him. He had stand-ins lie for him. He had um, uh, ghostwriters lie for him. So there's a very strange situation, which I don't think all biographers uh, face, that with Warhol, your goal as a biographer to reveal his intentions, to reveal what Warhol thought, can't rely on what Warhol said he thought, right? So it's a very strange situation. And I've been reading a lot of art history recently, ever since I finished the book, I've got time. And I realized that almost every art historian goes to the artist to find out what they say about their work. You go to them to find out what the work is about, and they tell you what the work is about. But with Warhol, because he's the world's most amazing obfuscator, you're in this situation where he's likely to tell you the opposite of what his work is about. I mean, what, where does Francis Bacon stand on this continuum, Annalyn? Uh, well, he was absolutely into obfuscation as well. He never oh, wanted God. anything revealed. He wanted his early design clear, uh, a career just completely obliterated. But he did not, you know, he had certain well-oiled lies, as it were, but nothing like your man. But, um, you know, the, uh, do you know the famous uh, Baltus uh, saying when he had a show at the Tate? And everybody was asking him for information. And Baltu said, uh, uh, begin by saying, there is nothing known about the artist. Now let us look at the art. Yeah. Well, I think that's what Warhol's goal was. I yeah. think he, he played the idiot and he lied so that he would be such an unreliable witness to his own intentions that you had no choice but to go to him, rather go to the art to figure out what it was about. But that's a weird situation for a biographer to be in, right? Because you don't want to just look at the art. You're not supposed to only be an art critic. You're supposed to be talking about the man and his thoughts. And that, that makes life complicated. The story of Warhol is complicated. Um, and then of course his fame makes it even more complicated because it distorts everyone's memories of him. I mean, you're a guaranteed whenever you talk about uh, Warhol with one of the people, even the people who knew him, they'll come out with some story about him as a soup eater. And it's pretty clear that they're making them up a lot of the time, right? Because it's too appealing not to say, oh yes, I saw him eating Campbell's soup. And I have one source who says, don't be, don't be ridiculous. He ne or sort of somebody who knew him extremely well, his chief assistant, Nathan Glock said, don't be ridiculous. He never ate Campbell's soup, which seems reliable to me, except that Nathan Glock, of course, would also have a reason for wanting to contradict everyone else because it gives him more power as a source. Yes, but Nathan was not the big druggie that everybody else was. So you know, my quiet thinking would be maybe maybe go with him. Quick question: How many since uh, he he you know went back to this Campbell's tomato soup series? Approximately how many of those famous famous cans are out there? Would you guess? 
Oh, not very many because, I mean, he made 32 of this series and he made a few larger and smaller ones beforehand. And then he made a series of prints and, and there's one other series of paintings, but there aren't that many Campbell soups, except of course, that every time someone handed him a can of Campbell soup, he was happy to sign it. So in that sense, there are an awful lot of signed Campbell soup cans out there. And there are also, I, I'm afraid to say, a number of forgeries of drawings of Campbell's soup that might just not be by Andy Warhol. Um, so it does make you a little bit, a little bit suspicious. Um, but one of the things, I mean, I was saying that, that you can't just talk about the art, but I think that one of the things that both of us like about writing an artist's biography is that you do have the art as objects that ground you. And for me, it's important that they free me from the typical kind of literary storytelling that happens in a lot of biography that I'm not quite as fond of as some people are. It saves me from some of the psychologizing that you're supposed to do as a biographer. It lets me keep coming back to the objects. It gives me a, sta a scaffold of real things in the real world rather than just the foibles of a personality in an attempt to look into the soul of Andy Warhol. I, I challenge anyone not only to look into the soul of Andy Warhol, but to find the soul of Andy Warhol to look into it. And I'm not interested in souls. It's not something I believe in a lot. And I'm very happy to have the objects that give me a, a scaffold. And the great thing about Andy Warhol is, or the great and horrible thing, is that the objects have been studied endlessly by incredibly smart people. So that gives you a scaffolding of smart ideas to climb, to resist. There's all sorts of great writing about Warhol, which is challenging. I won't say it isn't because you can't read it all, right? When you're reading a few hundred thousand primary sources, you can't also read a few thousand articles on Andy Warhol, scholarly articles, but at least the ideas are out there. So that I think helps avoid some of the sort of cliches you might fall into otherwise. Well, again, how many years did you spend on this project? It's also hard to say the day you started and the day you ended, but something like seven years. Seven years, a lot of things a week, you know, uh, close to 14, 16 hours a day, a lot of that, always seven days a week. So it was, it was a project and a half. I would say that's a very, very quick turnaround. <laughs> so congratulations. Why don't, why don't we go to the next slide so yeah, that people... Absolutely. Let's do that. Now, I'm actually going to take us back in time. Uh, I wanted to start with the Campbell Soups. And, but then I want to go back to uh, the 50s, which is when Warhol showed these gay drawings um, of his, um, because it mattered to me, these, these are interesting from the point of art biography, and that's one of the things we are, after all, being sponsored here by the Leon Levy Center, which is a biography center. Um, so let's talk about biography. One of the great things about Warhol and about his art is that they let you do a lot of social history, and that was really important for me. In my, in my book that is setting up the framework that Warhol was working in. And for Warhol, the framework of gay history is really important. And there were a lot of interesting things that let me get to the core of Warhol's gay identity, Warhol's gay history, and the important gay art he made. So it's nice that the social history, the social context for the man and his art coincide in a sense, that you have to do the social history for understanding either of them. And you can't understand Andy Warhol without understanding that he came from the most homophobic place possibly in America. I mean, Pittsburgh in the 40s, I've said this before in other contexts, it was just a nightmare. But the 1950s art world in New York wasn't a whole lot better. Um, so there's this sense with Warhol that telling the full story of him as a gay man is also telling the story of his art. Um, that this art, you know, that in the 50s, a lot of his art actually was explicitly gay. And I think we've lost track of that to a, to a certain extent. Um, but these kind of images also for me bring up the, another problem that comes up when you're writing about Warhol. And I think that this must be true of de Kooning and Bacon as well, which is that when you're writing about such famous artists, superstar artists, there's a tendency to be confronted with a kind of unthinking adulation. There's a sense that the public has at least that you're supposed to love almost everything they did, right? Once someone is a Warholian or once someone is a de Kooningian, a de, Koon, de Kooninginian, um, they are, there's an automatic sense that they expect it to be positive and that they're positive. So the notion that Warhol, for instance, was this superb illustrator in the 1950s is something I had to fight against and, and if you like complexify it, to get away from that cliche. Because I think he was just the normal, he had normal, excellent skills as an illustrator, like so many others did. He was kind of derivative of a lot of other illustrators. 
Um, but studying the gay history really woke me up to how much content mattered in Warhol, that even if his style was quite a lot like, like Jean Cocteau and often quite a lot like, like Ben Sean, his explicit gay subjects were incredibly daring and radical for that moment. So in a sense, at the, in the 1950s, you have to look through the style, which isn't that important, at the pure content. And I suddenly realized that's exactly what he comes to in the early 60s, right? The Campbell soup cans have, are of no interest stylistically. He realized that you could dilute art or rather concentrate art, distill art down to just content. So I love the way that I argue at least that the gay content of his 50s art, which is totally unacceptable, that got him in huge trouble, survives as pure, the notion of pure content into the, into the 1960s. Um, that's the kind of uh, biographer's game that I like to play at least. And so that's, that's my, my take. I mean, do you run into this, Anna Lynn, that, that there's a problem with being critical of the artists that you're writing about? I, I would say no, because uh, there were enough uh, moments in de Kooning's career where he fell off the pedestal. Uh, for example, just when, you know, Andy Warhol, all, all, all pop was happening, um, de Kooning was passe. You know, he left New York in the very early 60s because the kings were now dethroned. So there's always been more skepticism than you might imagine. I mean, there's been lots of skepticism about Warhol, but you know, Bacon had the same problem. And every time he ventured in a new direction or towards the end of his life became very more formally as an artist, he was untrained. That is true. A myth that happens to be true. Um, so they're, they're in each case, you know, they weren't say, no, they weren't Picasso, since we keep using that, you know, who had protean skills at every single point. So, uh, you know, I, yes, yeah, I, but your point here is very, very interesting, how this reflects, a, ripples across his career. I mean, for me, the problem is not so much his reception in his own day, because there were a lot of, a lot of actually quite stupid hating of Warhol that went on in the 60s and afterwards. It's that there's a kind of, the people who like Warhol now, like Warhol an awful, awful, awful lot. And they read his genius and from 1962 back into everything he did. I mean, as a student, he was one of the best students in college, but he still made student work. And there's a tendency to see everything he ever touched as coming from the same genius who was a genuine genius when he did the Campbell soup cans. So there's, I think Warhol's been canonized, sainted even, in a way that, that other artists hadn't quite been, at least among his fans. But then of course, he's also a devil for a lot of more conservative critics to this day, which is kind of surprising. He's a lightning rod, you know, yeah. he really is, Blake, in a way I think that the rest of us escape simply because he was so famous and continues to be famous, you know? And complex. I mean, it's impossible to come to a sort of final conclusion about Warhol at all. So there really is room for disagreement about almost everything he ever did. There's still people who think he was an absolute fraud from beginning to end. You know, living art critics feel that way about him. And I don't think that's true of most artists of his stature, you know, who are in the canon. Um, and I think I can tell you one reason they feel that way. And let's go to the next slide uh, to show why that might be. And that's because of this guy here. Right. Um, this guy, Andy Warhol, and I'll put him in, in quotes, is our problem. Um, the guy in, in leather glasses who appears in, uh, in shade, you know, leather glasses, sorry about that, in leather jacket and dark glasses. This is sort of the classic, iconic Warhol look, and he's kind of a goofball. I mean, I like the way his tongue is even sticking out here, you know. That's the classic War Warhol look. And there's still people who think that's the real Warhol. So it's easy to dismiss this fool, this show off, this, this uh, superficial celebrity as the maker of all the art and identical to all the art. And there's kind of a reason for that, which is the cliche now that Warhol himself was his own greatest work of art. Um, that's a cliche, but I think it's also a central, uh, genuine important point about Warhol. And it's what makes writing his biography, I think really different from a lot of other biographies. I mean, Bacon was an extremely famous character, but I don't think a lot of people see him as coterminous with his art. Am I right, Annalyn, about that? 
um, to a lesser degree than Warhol, but I think in general, he was his theatrical performance, which extended off the canvas, was quite similar. So they they have something in common there. Right. But the, you know, again, Warhol just took off at a moment in time, you know, and to your point, has continued to look very very relevant, and that is something that that sets him apart, and people can take pot shots at him or love him, but he's still in the news somehow. Yeah. That wild, that, and I didn't expect that. I have to admit that when I launched my book in, in March, I expected, you know, all sorts of criticism as we all do, but I didn't expect anyone to go after Warhol. I expected people maybe to go after me. Of course, I hope they wouldn't. But what surprised me is that when there were negative reviews of my book, and there hadn't been all that many, luckily, it was usually because someone hated Warhol and thought he was worthless. And that took me by surprise, that an artist as famous, as canonical as he is in art history, could still cause quite as much a ruckus as he did. And again, well, I think that's partly because it's not only about his work, it's about him. Um, exactly, and you mentioned to me, just apropos this, that uh, the, some of the reviews in England of your book, you know, they were still like pooh-pahing and poo-pooing that this uh, American, how, how could we possibly say that he is a great uh, artist, right? Yeah, absolutely. That was the initial reception of my book. It appeared in England a month before it appeared in the United States. And that was the initial reaction in, among a lot of more conservative British critics. And they specialize in conservative critics in a way we don't quite. Um, but, you know, regardless of whether you like Warhol as a person or not, there was still something very, and I can't say that I always do, his, his fictional persona can be annoying, right? At a certain point, you get fed up with the silly guy with his finger, you know, his, his finger in it on his mouth. Um, but it's still exciting for a biographer who's also an art critic, because in the act of writing Warhol's life, I got to do art criticism definitionally, right? If he's one of his, his greatest works of art, and I really believe that's not just a cliche, it's not just a figure of speech, it's something really important about him and about his art, that when you're writing about him, you're writing about his work. That I like to talk about my book sometimes, and I've said this before, as a nonfiction account of a fiction named Andy Warhol, right? That that's really, I don't care if I get to the real Andy Warhol, so long as I really tear apart the fake one. So long as I come to understand everything about this fake character called Andy Warhol. That, in a sense, is more interesting than imagining that I'm gonna get to the heart of the soul of Andy Warhol. I'm happy as an art critic, let's put on my art critic hat for a minute, to say that if I can, I'll use a horrible word, deconstruct the fiction of Andy Warhol, I've gotten 90% of the way with the, the real man, in a sense, Andy Warhol. Um, and it was incredibly fun doing that tracking. Um, one of my favorite moments, and I guess I've mentioned this before, is that I got to take on a, on a kind of, had this sudden, uh, I don't know what it was, a, a sudden moment where I realized I wanted to get an optometrist to look at the shade that he wears in all these photographs. So I got permission to take a whole bunch of pairs of his sunglasses to an, an optometrist around the corner from the Andy Warhol Museum. And it turns out that they're all prescription sunglasses. So he wasn't just a cool cat wearing them. He had no choice but to wear them. Once he put them on in the morning, he was stuck in these stupid shades, which is why you see him day and night, right? You see parties, dark parties, where he's wearing the damn sunglasses because he couldn't take them off. So he's hiding the real Warhol, the four eyes Warhol behind the cool cat. So that, the way in which he was so careful in his construction of a persona was incredibly fun to follow. Um, I, I really got, it was amazing the way in which you could capture almost every moment of him building that persona by looking. And I'll just show you one other image that shows you. I mean, one of the funny things about Warhol is that this Warhol that we're looking at now, the leather jacket and dark glasses Warhol, has come to so dominate our image of him the people imagine that the artist, this is this photograph is from 1966, and he only created this persona in 1965, really. But that is officially the pop art Warhol. That's the Warhol that people think painted the Campbell soup cans, who made the Brillo boxes. But that's not true. There's a great photograph that, that I'll show us now of uh, 1962 happening by... Um, by Clay Oldenburg in October of 1962. And there's Andy Warhol. Can you see him in the gray jacket in the middle? A beautiful, fancy, you know, very stylish and, uh, and almost, I don't know, but it's not sober exactly, but certainly not the guy in the leather jacket, right? This is the Warhol that existed right through really till 1964. This is the guy who made all the pop art. 
By the time he becomes the Andy Warhol we think we know as the pop artist, he stopped making pop art. So there's this great complexity to Warhol's persona and to our understanding of it and our misunderstanding that made it really fun working on, on Warhol, on this creation, this, this fiction called Andy Warhol. Oh, I can't hear you even a little bit, Annalyn, and I can't read lips very well. Can we? Can you I hear am... me now? Now I can, yes, you were muted for a second. Okay, um, what I was just quickly saying is uh, this is a priceless photo because of course, Andy Warhol looks completely Brooks Brothers in, in front of performance yeah. art. You yeah. know? So the, the transformation that was coming in the next couple of years was astonishing. Yeah, that's right. And he was in the audience for all these things. I mean, this is October 62. He's already had his Campbell Soup show. He's about to have his first solo show in New York at the Stable Gallery, but he's still the guy who looks like a collector. I mean, he first entered the art world as a collector. And here he looks like a kind of semi-square collector, you know, a well-paid illustrator who's looking at a happening, maybe thinking of buying one of the props even. So that's still who he is at this moment, even though he's also just about becoming the great pop artist. Um, and that's totally typical. John Chamberlain, the, the heavy set man in front of him, is the artist who looks like an artist in this photograph. Warhol standing just behind him. John Chamberlain's the great sculptor who crushed cars as his signature work. And to see Andy standing behind him, little skinny Andy standing behind him as a kind of collector figure is one of my favorite moments. I discovered this photograph uh, yesterday on a wonderful Instagram site called Andygrams. And it's worth going just to that site because I'm borrowing this image from there. And let's, I think we have time to look at one more, as it were, work of art by Andy Warhol before we go to questions. So let's do that because it answers, it goes some way to answering the other questions you were asking me about. And that is this. This is one of Andy's a time capsule, so I think a lot of people have probably heard of, but maybe not everyone. In 1974, he started filling these things he called time capsules. Often it was literally everything that was on his desk at the end of the day, end of the week. He would literally just take everything, every bit of junk that came in, and he received a lot of junk mail, and throw it into a banker's box, a cardboard banker's box, along with works of art that he made, films he made, uh, letters from the 1950s from his mother, invoices, uh, ticket stubs, every kind of object you could ever imagine. He threw into these boxes, taped them shut, usually dated them, and declared them works of art called the time capsule. So they are sculptures called the time capsules. They are also, of course, the most amazing source for a biographer like me. So there's this very weird thing, and this relates to, I think, everything about writing a biography of Andy Warhol, everything is both part of who he is and evidence for who he is. And here we have a case of these 610 time capsules with what, a thousand objects in a lot of them, 500 in others. We're talking at least half a million objects in these time capsules. And they're sitting there, they've been inventoried in a kind of, uh, I won't say superficial way, but a, a quick way. They're getting cataloged, so they catalog, you know, uh, an art collection. And there they are waiting to be looked at by a biographer. Now I had the luck or the horror of coming along just when they finished doing this. So they were all available to me. And that was the great and horrible challenge. I mean, these things I think are really a bad I work out. They were made to mess with people like me. They were made to make fun of the whole notion of the artist's archive, that the artist can be encapsulated in the detritus of their life. Right, or maybe not the detritus. Most artists have beautifully organized archives. Someone has gone to the trouble of keeping the important stuff and throwing away the unimportant stuff. Warhol did exactly the opposite. Um, it's sometimes hard to remember that they were meant to confuse us, I think, not to elucidate anything. Even though they're called time capsules, time capsules are usually meant to give information about the moment that they reflect. They're meant to, to uh, contain only the most important things that will inform. These were exactly the opposite. And from the beginning, I think, they were exactly the opposite. And of course, they invite the biographer to commit the cardinal sin of biography, which is to include every, everything but the kitchen sink, right? That's the great danger of biography. You must feel that when you're writing your biographies too, right? There's some tidbit 
that you should be leaving on the floor but can't. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Blake, I wish there were more tidbits, but you know, really, we are at opposite poles. I mean, we had uh, the dickens of a time trying to do a deep archival dive like like you did. I mean, it was all reconstructed from uh, secondary sources uh, for the most part. But um, again, I think uh, on balance, I would rather be on our side of the equation because I think it is so difficult are you here to tell us that we have this many time capsules plus another 100,000 objects in that archive? Oh, no, I'm not here to tell you that. I'm here to tell you that there's at least this 610 time capsules and probably at least as much other information, not less, in the normal storage in the museum's archives. This is, these are just the works of art called time capsules, but we're all left behind untold even more disorganized boxes of random material that I also got to go through. But there I didn't even have an inventory. A lot of the time I had virtually no idea of what would be in a box. Um, it was both beautiful and absolutely terrifying. Um, but of course the nice thing about it is that there's a small sense at least that in order to write a biography of Andy Warhol, the world's great hoarder, the world's great obfuscator, there probably should be a tiny bit at least of random information. You should try to capture uh, in a very small way at least some of the pleasure in, in your hunt. And there has to be a little tiny bit of excess, I think, somewhere in the story to capture the fact that all this information is there. So for me, for instance, writing uh, four or five pages just about Andy's cats, which is probably for, for at least three or four pages too much, was something that I just couldn't resist. That seemed Warholian to me. To dig in deep into the reality behind Andy's 25 or 17 or however many cats he actually had, that felt necessary to me. It was my tiny time capsule moment in the book. Or, and I guess I'm slightly ashamed of this, when you come across several references to the size of Andy's penis, it seemed impossible not to include that in the book. Not only, I don't know any biographer, maybe I do know biographers who'd resist. I'm not a biographer who could resist a factoid like that. But it helps that Warhol himself was obsessed with the size of people's penises. So it seemed only right to get revenge by outing his penis size in, in, in my book. But there are inevitably things like that that you just can't leave on the floor that you put in, a time, in the time capsule of your biography, in a sense, because you can't resist it. You know, I think all biographers are to a certain extent makers of time capsules. What do you think? At where you let yourself go, as it were, about his Siamese cats. Um, the beginning, the, the very beginning of your book, very vivid moment that I wish you'd sort of talk about. And there you seem to, you know, when he almost died the first time, there you seem to have just really gone in and wanted the sort of dramatic detail. You must have reported the hell out of that uh, particular moment. Yeah, you know, so the book begins with literally the moment that Andy's on the operating table, pretty much, or actually in the ER, busy dying, and then he has this insane operation. Well, this is one of the things that happens to any biographer, I think, where you're just given a gift where the world gives you a gift. And this was a gift of a medical historian called John Ryan, an emeritus surgeon who became a medical historian, is now a medical historian, who invited me to interview Andy Surgeon uh, at the same time as him. So to hear John Ryan and Giuseppe Rossi talk about the operation that Giuseppe Rossi did on June 3rd, 1968, made it inevitable that I would begin the book with that. Because to hear these two talented surgeons talk about exactly what went on in the ER as they as Giuseppe Rossi you know in his 80s when I spoke to him cut into Andy Warhol I mean John Ryan there are photographs of Andy's scars and he kept saying well wait a minute why does he have this scar and Rossi would say well I was looking for a source of bleeding so I cut him there and you know kind of as good a place to cut him as anywhere so these absurd photographs these Frankenstein photographs of Andy covered in scars got explained for me. And once that happened, there was no way that, you know, I don't think of myself as a writer first and foremost. I'm a historian, I'm a, an art critic first who happens to have to write as the only way of communicating. I mean, I like to say that if I could do a Vulcan mind meld with my reader, I'd prefer to do that than have to use words. But even a writer like me, when I came across this incredible tale of the operation, 
there was no way I couldn't, I could not begin my book with that. Where you also expand again into a dramatic realm that we sometimes don't get elsewhere, you know, because your focus is elsewhere. But when Valerie that afternoon makes her slow way up to the 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 loft to you know to shoot him, there again you just it, it, you're almost the readers is there moment by moment, uh, which is a sort of nice interlude in in the book because it's all there and also immediate. Although there's a good case. The surgery, you know, I trust Giuseppe Rossi on that surgery. Uh, and we've got some, some operative notes that survive. I mean, there is some real good information. The Valerie Solanus thing is worth looking at my end notes, at least glancing at my end notes, because everything I tried to triangulate what seemed to me the most likely bit of that story. But it's kind of like Andy Campbell Coops. It's such a famous moment in his life that it's told differently by every eyewitness even right? You get radically different versions of what happened that day. So I had to put on my author's hat at that moment, my uh, novelist's hat, even if you like, and say, okay, I'm going to tell one of these stories, because it would be too annoying to at every minute say, well, so-and-so says X and so-and-so says says Y. I had to be able to tell a story at that point. And again, one is saved by one's end notes, because if someone wants to find out the other versions, they can go to the goddamn end notes and more power to them. So that was really, I'm uh, you know, it's now becoming slightly more common for EndNotes to be online, and I think this will be really salutary. I mean, I know someone who's writing the history of digital imaging, and his publisher, of course, wouldn't let him have a thousand pages of EndNotes in the book, but he's going to put them all online so that information isn't lost to the world. Because that's one of the dangers, is here you do all this research, and if you don't make it available somewhere, it's gone. Someone else might never find the document that you found. So I'm, I can't tell you how happy I am to have the internet. And just as a little aside, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, I couldn't, well, I for one could never have written my book without the internet. Access to all oh, of the material. Totally. You are so right. For peripheral, secondary, tertiary characters, you know, and you can sort of come up to speed and then think of, you know, the questions, you know, beam in on what you should be asking and, and the major points. I could not agree with you more. The difference between writing a book uh, as Kai said, our, our De Kooning was published in 2004 or five. Um, and, and now is it not, it, well, I guess like you don't have a prior biography, but it is astonishing, astonishing how the world has changed and to our benefit. But we have a, a maybe one or two more images before we open it up for questions. Well, you know what? I think it's time to, to open it up for questions. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking forever and ever and ever. This is actually not a bad this gets us into the subject of how biographies are written, the time capsule does. So let's just go to people's questions instead. Okay, so um, what I want to do here is quickly see, um, when you make the decision to embark on a biography, do you do any research um, any, to see if some other writer is working on the same subject and has a big head start? <laughs> yes, you do. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know what? You don't really have to do that in a sense. Um, in my case, I had an agent involved from the very beginning. Um, and I've, of course, I was in dialogue with the Warhol Museum. So they would have told me, Blake, you're barking up the wrong tree. There's already someone who's gone through all the time capsules. Right. So I could, I knew perfectly well there was no one else doing quite the kind of work I was doing. So I was lucky in that way. But yeah, I think every. Uh, every biographer has to do some groundwork to find out. I think there have been cases where someone didn't know. I've heard rumors of cases where two biographies began simultaneously without people knowing, but you soon start interviewing people and they say, wait, there's someone else writing a biography at the same time. And that happened to me even, because I would interview someone and they'd say, oh, just last week I spoke to someone else writing about Warhol and I would find out it was a PhD student or a, a scholar, so there wasn't any risk to my biography. But yeah, um, Annalyn, have you come across, is there anyone else galloping forward with a Bacon biography? Could draw upon them. Uh, they, two of them were, were written by uh, people who actually knew or were friends with Bacon. But at the same time, they hadn't really done uh, the really deep dive uh, research that you and I have been talking about this whole hour. So it gave us the opportunity to do that um, as well. So we, it was kind of advantageous situation. Blake, on the other hand, I can't find you on my screen. So I'm just going to keep ask, <laughs> relaying questions. I don't know why I can't see you anymore. Can you see me? I see you. I hear you. Okay. I everyone else can see me too. So I think we're good. 
Okay, so I don't matter. So other question, were there other biographies, not necessarily artist biographies that inspired or helped you to decide how to write your biography of Warhol? Excellent question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I can't pretend that I'm a giant, have been over the years, a giant biography fan. Of course, when I decided to write a biography, I write, read lots of others. And this is sound, gonna sound strange, but the biographer that I liked most before writing my biography was a guy called Joseph Ellis, the great scholar of 18th century America, of revolutionary America. And he's written a series of very short biographies of figures like Thomas Jefferson. And what I liked about them, even though they in a way were nothing like mine because the giant biographies of all these figures had already been written, is that they're very much about arguments. He's very much making claims about the figures he's writing about. And that was important for me as a model for what I'm doing in my book. Even though it's very long, I hope that it's built around a series of claims and arguments about Andy Warhol. Andy as a uh, well-educated, not a naive artist. Andy is a serious modernist. Andy is a modernist, among other things. They're all of these claims I'm making. So I really enjoyed those shorter biographies by Joseph Ellis. And then, you know, I started life as a Renaissance art historian. I shouldn't say I started life. I was not born as a Renaissance art historian, but I started my career as that. So um, Giorgio Vasari's Lives of the Artists is deep in my head at every moment. My PhD involved reading it many times cover to cover. So that is in the background at every moment. And he's a great storyteller, but he also has real, the real stakes are historical, are critical stakes in his work. So that mix of talking about art and talking about people and talking about the art through the people, I got uh, in my, you know, from the beginning of my education as an art historian. So those two, Joseph Ellis, who writes tiny little books, and Giorgio Vasari, who writes volumes and volumes, are kind of my two models. And you know what's really wonderful too, Blake, about your writing is you started off as an academic and yet there is not, and I'm complimenting you highly, there's not a whiff of overly academic writing in your book. So now we're gonna go on another question. Um, this is an interesting one too. Did you have permission problems with the Warhol Foundation? Did you avail yourself of fair use quotation of material? Well, remember, uh, just people often get confused. This is a really good moment to say this. The Warhol Foundation owns copyright to Andy Warhol's works. The Warhol Museum's, Museum owns the objects themselves. And you can look at any object you want to. You can talk about an object. You can talk about what's in a letter. The only problem would be if I'd wanted to quote at vast length from something or, of course, wanted to show a lot of Warhol's art. Um, then I, of course, whenever I actually reproduced an image of his art, I had to go to the foundation and they were very, very helpful. Um, you know, my book is a biography, not a, a book about art. So it doesn't have a lot of images of Warhol's art. It has a million images of Warhol, which mattered a lot to me. Every chapter begins with a different image of Warhol from the moment that the chapter discusses. And I love just going through the 52 images that represent 52 stations on the way to Warhol's death, if you like. Um, so no, there wasn't really a problem there because I mean, except when I wanted to quote at length from, from a Warhol document, and I did occasionally, the Warhol Foundation was absolutely happy to have me do that. Uh, I, they never refused anything. Um, but I don't do that at vast length. As a biographer, you don't quote huge bleeding gobbets of the person talking. That would be very boring. And you don't need permission to talk about someone or about a text. So that it really wasn't too much of an issue. And the Warhol Museum was deeply collaborative. They wanted a good biography written. They felt there was a need for one. And I spent weeks and weeks and weeks going through that archive. They were vastly helpful. Uh, the, bio, you know, the archivists were amazingly helpful to me. You, you know, we are both very, very lucky in that sense, Blake, because, you know, uh, the, the uh, questioner here is on to something. Um, estates can stop you in your tracks, as we know. And it's very difficult, I would submit, uh, for us today as biographers of artists to work around an estate. I mean, they have a complete all rights reserved. And so if they don't like your take on a biography, then... That's it. Do you know what I mean? That's that's a so for, yeah, yeah. researchers and and potential biographers need to know that that a state can be tremendously helpful or tremendously unhelpful. I'm lucky that all the documents were given out of the estate to a museum where they are, of course, public. You know, museums are there for the public good. So I'm really lucky that I didn't really. I mean, the state was fabulously friendly to me, but I didn't have to deal with them very much at all. 
you know, just occasionally if I wanted to quote from a letter or something. But the, muse the objects are there in a museum who's, you know, which is founded to serve the public in a sense. So I was really lucky in that. Yes, you definitely were. And uh, you, you mentioned something that sounded vaguely Catholic about two minutes ago. So this is a, a great uh, question, which might be our last, which is, um, can you speak to the asexual Catholic Warhol? Is this all deception in a counter persona? Uh, yeah, yes, I, can, I mean, I think those are two separate characters, the so-called asexual and the maybe so-called Catholic. I could speak first to the asexual Warhol was def definitely never existed on this planet. Um, there is lots and lots of evidence, including medical reports, that Warhol was a very active or relatively active sexual, uh, sexually active gay man. Um, you know, the gay scene in 60s and especially 70s New York could be pretty sexually advent ad adventurous. And he was definitely on the tamer side of sexuality for a gay man in the 70s, at least, and certainly in the 60s. But there is tons of evidence for him being sexually interested. Exactly what he got up to in bed is a little harder. You have some evidence about that. But he slept with his partner, a male partner, in the same bed for 12 years. You know, he was, he liked grabbing men's crotches. I mean, he looked at images of men with erections. He drew pictures, hundreds or dozens of pictures of men with erections in the 50s. You cannot call somebody who draws those pictures asexual. Sexuality isn't only about some kind of penetration. It's bigger than that. You know, that if you is like true. you like pornography as we all did, you're sexual. But you know, it is also true, and I, I think this this uh, person picked up on this. I was really interested that uh, that throughout your book, you know, there was this tiny little, you know, reminder in the background that uh, uh, Mrs. Warhola would be going to church and he would send, uh, you know, he wouldn't go with her when relatives were there. But this little tickle in your mind all along, they, you know, I could actually see this kind of slight Warholian figure standing in a church. And he may not have been a believer in any sense that, you know, the Catholic Church wants you or the uh, Orthodox Church wants you to. But, you know, he didn't finally, did he ever finally uh, make a complete break with religion? Absolutely. Well, uh, it depends on what you mean by religion. With, with church going, yeah. definitely not. Spirituality. It's really complicated. A um, couple of things that drive me crazy is when people just talk about him as a Catholic, as though he was a normal Roman Catholic, like an Irish American or an Italian American. His particular brand of Catholicism was miles and miles away from Roman Catholicism from the Catholicism all around him in Pittsburgh. And that tension is really important for understanding him. I mean, the Roman Catholics, the Irish Catholics especially, and the Byzantine or Greek Catholics that, that included Warhol, Warhol's particular ethnic group was at the heart of it, were at war for a lot of the 1920s and the sort of 30s. I mean, Warhol, uh, the priests in Warhol's church got married and that was considered absolutely scandalous for the rest of American Catholicism. So that's really important to understand, first of all, to say he was a Catholic like the other Catholics in his factory, because there were a bunch of other Catholics at the factory as well, is really papering over some very important differences. Uh, I think the way I'd summarize it is that he was more religious than you'd expect for a gay radical avant-gardist of the 1960s and 70s, but probably went to church a whole lot less in fact, statistically, went to church a whole lot less than the average American of the 1960s, right? America was still a pretty devout place in the 1960s. By the way, there's very little evidence for him being a regular churchgoer um, early in the 60s. It's really mostly later, after his shooting, that he seems to be going more regularly to the church. Can we look into his soul? I mean, he was someone who also believed in crystals. He was definitely a bad Catholic in any dogmatic sense, right? You couldn't be a good Catholic and be gay. That, those were contradiction in terms. Did he know anything about the theology of Catholicism? I think there's no evidence that he knew, you know, anything about the triune God or any of the central uh, concepts of Catholicism. Um, he was asked, do you believe in an afterlife? And he said, no. Well, believing in an afterlife is kind of central to being a Catholic, right? It, it is true, but Blakey was also a good mama's boy. So, you yeah, know- he went to church. He absolutely yeah, went to church. Happened, right? There is a man of, of real complexity and anybody yeah. who uh, tries to insist that he was just a, a one pony show, you know, all about promotion, there, there is, you know, 
there's so many dimensions that you can pursue here. I mean, after all, he hid it to Catholicism mostly, right? To the extent that he was religious, he hid it, right? So he, he was putting on the image of being a bad boy and hiding the fact that he was often a pretty good boy. And that was true about other things too, like his generosity. He could be phenomenally generous to people, to his intimates. He could really be uh, both financially generous and spiritually generous. And yet he always hid behind this kind of creepy, uh, cheap state. <laughs> the reality, I have to say. He could be cheap as anything. That is wonderful. That's probably a great note to end on because I believe, Blake, we are going to run out of time very, yeah. very, very soon. So I think that uh, we should... Thank everybody for coming in and to Kai and the Leon Levy Center for hosting this evening and to Thad for helping us get underway. And I have to thank the Leon Levy Center for, um, for helping me for a whole year. I was in residence there. They gave me a nice little salary. I had fabulous access to libraries. I could not have written this book without them. So I have to thank the Leon Levy Foundation for making that possible at the Leon Levy Center. And on that happy note, thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Forza Warhol, as the Italians would say. <laughs>